Hello everybody and welcome to Learn Hittite and today I would like to talk to you about why I think that this sign is the most famous sign in all of linguistics. Actually I have no idea if that statement is true but what I would say is that um, Proto-Indo-European laryngeals which this sign represents have been something that linguists have worked on, debated over, argued about for in excess of 140 years now and the history of which is interesting and definitely relevant to any learner of Hittite, hence why I'm going to talk about it today. And to be honest, as I think about it, I would guess that after tone in language, laryngeals and maybe click consonants and what R variability are probably some of the most written about subjects in linguistics. Let me start by saying that this um, lesson today is intended for people who are just beginning their journey learning a foreign language or ancient language like Hittite. It's not supposed to be a deep dive into ablaut or laryngeal theory, two things that we're going to talk about today. It's just an overview. If you want something deeper, I suggest checking out some of the material on Simon Roper's excellent YouTube channel. He's done a video on Proto-Indo-European vowels and laryngeals alongside a YouTube channel that I've recently discovered, like literally two days ago, Watch Your Language, who did an excellent presentation on laryngeal theory. So where do we begin? Well, I guess like every good story, we should start at the very beginning. And where is the beginning? Well, it is about 4,500 years BCE on the Pontic Caspian Steppe, where there was a language that was spoken that linguists call Proto-Indo-European. It's not attested. We don't have any um, written samples of it. And unfortunately, nobody gave us the courtesy of living long enough uh, to give us a sample from a native speaker. However, we can reconstruct it based on looking at how the daughter languages of Proto-Indo-European look like. Now, this Proto-Indo-European would have had a community of speakers and they would have spoken on a dialect continuum. And as groups of these speakers began to migrate, move away from each other, these different dialects will have evolved into different languages. Linguists try to recreate the evolution of these languages into the daughter languages of many European and, and Asian languages today by using a, a, a tree diagram. It's not the best representation, but it works. Pretty much the only thing that linguists can agree on is that Anatolian broke off first. Anatolian obviously being the branch which gave us Hittite. There is some kind of consensus that Tukarian broke off next. Uh, afterwards, probably Italo-Celtic, where we get Latin and the modern day Welsh, Irish, things like this. Greek is usually comes next. It's considered quite a late branch from Proto-Indo-European. And then we get kind of a cluster or a node of three, uh, one being Germanic, which obviously gave us English. One being Balto-Slavic, where we get the Baltic languages and the Slavic languages like Polish, Russian, Lithuanian. And we have the Indo-Iranic, which I will represent here. That's generally how linguists see the um, evolution of Proto-Indo-European into its subsequent dialects, which became fully fledged languages. Now, linguists were able to reconstruct this tree by looking at the daughter languages in the beginning, they specifically focused their attention on Greek, Sanskrit and Latin. And by observing that these languages were similar in many ways in terms of grammar and vocabulary, but also they noticed one key similarity between these languages, which was a process called ablaut. What is ablaut, you may be asking or you may be thinking? Well, let me explain it for you. We see a classic example of ablaut in English in the following. Sing sang, sung, song. What we have here is three verb forms and one noun. And all that we've actually done to give us our three verb forms and one noun is take the consonant skeleton of S, N and G and we vary the vowel that we use in the middle. So with sing we get this form and with the O vowel we get a noun. This is ablaut. Take a consonant skeleton, it can be a root or a suffix form, modify the vowel to change the meaning. And this ablaut 
English inherited from Proto-Indo-European. And it's present in all of the daughter languages of Proto-Indo-European to a greater or lesser extent. It is, however, particularly observable in Greek. Let me give you a Greek example. I'm not going to write using the Greek alphabet. Let me just transliterate it. We have Pharaoh, Phoros, and Diphros. Pharaoh means something like to bring or to carry. Phoros means something like tax or tribute. And Diphros means like two person seat on a chariot. So I don't know, double chariot seat. But you see that they all kind of like share a similar idea of moving something. Because obviously your tax or your tribute, you would have to um, send your grain or your, you know, whatever it is that you produced to your overlord. Nowadays, we have to do the same in the payment of our taxes. The double chariot seat is carrying or bringing your body and the body of a friend uh, somewhere else. And of course, we've got the verb form here. And linguists notice this very predictable pattern of ablaut, where which we have e, o, and then the vowel is removed. This first form is often called e grade ablaut, second form o grade ablaut, and the third form zero grade, for obvious reasons. The vowel disappears. So we see ablaut very well in Greek to a certain extent in English, but even in some daughter languages which didn't really inherit much ablaut, like Polish, we also see some examples of it. In, for example, the Polish verb nieść versus noszyć. We have the variants here in the vowel, this being ablaut. Now, as much as linguists like to find similarities between languages, they love more to find when these uh, patterns or these rules don't work when there's irregular systems, irregularities. And it wasn't too long before linguists began to notice that in these Indo-European daughter languages that there were some strange or unusual forms of ablaut. What do we mean by strange or unusual forms? Well, let's take sing, sang, sung. You would expect then with a similar consonant pattern uh, of uh, R plus NNG, ring, rang, rung, right? Well, let's say that you didn't get ring, rang, rung, but you got something like ring, rong, reng with uh, like a long e vowel, a short o vowel and a short e vowel in the third form. This is an irregular pattern. It's not perhaps what we would expect. And that's exactly what linguists noticed in Greek and to a certain extent in Sanskrit. Now, linguists wanted to know why was this? Where was this irregular ablaut coming from? Some early linguists attempted to explain it by just saying that, well, these irregular ablaut forms simply show that in Proto-Indo-European, we probably had quite a large inventory of vowel sounds, and they're just present in these irregular ablaut forms. So there's nothing irregular about it. It's just a different form of ablaut. In fact, linguists like Carl Brugman stated that because in the daughter languages of Proto-Indo-European that very often we have an A, an I, a U, alongside an O and an E, with short versions and long versions, that probably this was the repertoire present in Proto-Indo-European. However, there was another linguist called Ferdinand Saussure who postulated something different. He postulated that these unusual forms of ablaut found in, in some certain Greek verbs and Sanskrit verbs, for example, to give, to stand and to put, could actually be explained by something else, by the presence of something that he called sonant coefficients. He gave a Greek example. He gave didomi, which means I give, and doron, which means gift. Here we have two long o vowels, when actually we would expect an e grade and an o grade. And Saussure was radical at the time because he thought that the reason we get this irregular R is that something's happening to the original uh, Proto-Indo-European vowels E and R, that they're being modified by these sonant coefficients. 
and that as the daughter languages evolved, these sonant coefficients were eventually dropped, or that rather the sound was merged or influenced the vowel, and the vowel kind of like, you know, let's say, ate up or consumed this sonant coefficient, and in and of itself changed its vowel quality, you know, to this, um, these forms that we saw in the actual Greek. Sassur so stated that these sonant coefficients were probably semi-vowels, but later work by a Danish linguist called Hermann Müller, he modified that assumption by saying that actually rather they're likely to be consonants. And Sassur so and Müller thought that there were only two vowels in Proto-Indo-European, e and o, perhaps with slightly different qualities than that, and that these two vowels plus a repertoire of these sonant coefficients, possibly two or three different forms, were responsible for giving us the variance in vowels that we saw in daughter languages. And there was a big problem, however, in the sense that there was no direct evidence for this. We, in no daughter language, could actually see any evidence of these sonant coefficients, which was problematic because at the time, and you know, sometimes when I think about it, I tried to do exactly the same and put my, myself in the shoes of these early linguists and people like Karl Brugman. And, you know, probably the easiest answer and the simplest answer is probably the right answer. And I think that's Brugman's perspective, because Brugman didn't have this evidence that we, that we later have that we're going to talk about in the moment. And he basically said that, well, because of these different ablet forms, probably Proto-Indo-European had quite a wide inventory of vowels. So Sir and Muller saw it differently, but again, didn't necessarily have evidence for this um, two vowels modified by different sonant coefficients. However, in 1927, there was a paper by a professor called Jerzy Kurowicz from Poland. It was actually his second important paper of the year or influential paper of the year. And he pointed out that in the recently discovered and translated Hittite from the Anatolian branch of uh, Proto-Indo-European, we can see some words whose etymologies can be traced back to Proto-Indo-European that do have a sonant coefficient where we would expect it. And when Hittite was uh, translated, it occurred that this sonant coefficient that we're all expecting, like Müller predicted, wasn't a semi-vowel, but was actually an H sound. We know that because... Um, Hittite incorporated lots of vocabulary from uh, Hurrian and other non-Indo-European neighbouring languages of the Semitic language family tree that also have this laryngeal H sound. And so it seemed that we'd solved the mystery. And I just want to talk about Kurowicz a little bit because Kurowicz made this observation when our understanding of Hittite language was really in its infancy. I believe that the first grammar of Hittite had only been published like 10 years prior uh, to 1927 when uh, Kurowicz put all this together by Hrozhne. And, you know, in a world without the kind of modern communication tools that we have today, um, to be able to make this observation and to uh, connect it with these theories of Saussur and Muller, which were, I guess, in excess of 50 years prior, I think is really outstanding work on Kurowicz's behalf. I live in Poland and I'm sometimes really disappointed that we don't celebrate this character more uh, because I think he's really, uh, you know, a kind of shining star in Polish linguistics and Polish science uh, that deserves more recognition than he probably has. And so, yeah, you would imagine that bingo, from here um, we have uh, these irregular ablaut systems that we can now explain uh, by this, by the presence of this in um, the Anatolian languages. This would subsequently be called the laryngeal theory because this um, sound quality is a laryngeal sound. You would imagine that all linguists would hug each other, um, hold hands and walk off into the sunset together in complete agreement. However, that isn't the case and there is still lots of debate regarding laryngeal theory, mainly because of the way that um, Hittite doesn't actually have too many examples of these laryngeals which are in a part of words which have very solid Proto-Indo-European etymologies. It has many laryngeal words but they 
have dubious Proto-Indo-European etymologies or are probably just loan words from neighbouring languages, which is problematic. Um, you know, it, it kind of answered the question, but also left their room uh, for some doubt. Although I always think people forget that laryngeal theory tied up a few other loose ends as well, because um, many of the reconstructed forms, root forms in Proto-Indo-European, uh, obeyed this pattern that you would have a consonant and a vowel and a consonant. There were, however, a small category of reconstructions where we could only reconstruct a consonant and a vowel. This form is and was considered irregular. Well, this, these forms in Proto-Indo-European could actually be explained by a consonant, vowel and a consonant, which is actually one of these laryngeals. And the laryngeal simply disappeared in every daughter language, but not in the Anatolian where we have it preserved. So all those reconstructed uh, root forms that had a consonant and a, and a vowel uh, were actually consonant, vowel, consonant, and that second consonant was laryngeal, which disappeared over time. But as I said, laryngeal theory still gives linguists plenty of room to discuss and debate. So I hope that that explanation has been kind of sensical and that we uh, have a, an you know, introductory idea to these types of uh, these two uh, concepts in Proto-Indo-European linguistics and in linguistics in a wider sense as well, that is ablaut and the laryngeal theory, ablaut being the change in the vowel in a consonant skeleton to change the um, meaning or function of the uh, word, and laryngeal theory being this idea that Proto-Indo-European had a series of laryngeal sounds, H-like sounds, which were having influence on two Proto-Indo-European vowels, E and O, probably the only vowels that Proto-Indo-European had, and that in daughter languages, it was these laryngeals influencing these vowels that gave us the irregular ablaut forms. That would be the summary of what we just spoke about. But maybe you're here not for my um, dodgy explanations of ablaut and laryngeal theory, but you're here to see some examples of this interesting sign in action and that's what I'm going to give to you. But just before we move on to the next part of the lesson I want to say that most of the stuff that I presented you today is the perspective that was presented in a book called Introduction to Laryngeals by Lindemann. So I um, try. I, I feel that this book even though it's uh, a few years old now is still the best overview of these things of ablaut and laryngeal theory in Proto-Indo-European and that's where I tried to base most of my explanations today on. It's very in-depth, it's very complicated, um, you can find it online on archive.org, um, I've got a physical copy, it's well worth investing in it. Please go and check it out if you want a deeper look alongside those YouTube channels I spoke about earlier. Right, so these examples. Now, um, again, let's go back to the beginning. So we've got some Proto-Indo-European reconstructions of two words. We know that they're not attested, and in fact, no uh, Proto-Indo-European reconstruction is attested because they should have this star. I missed one here, so I've added it. Um, here we have the Proto-Indo-European word for grandfather. And here we have the Proto-Indo-European word for white or glittering, shining, something like that. Now let's focus on this form to begin with because I have given you here uh, the two forms of this word which evolved in the Anatolian branch and we have huhas and we have huhas. In the nominative singular, that's why this S is on the end here. These are actually the same word. You see them represented differently because of different uh, you know, conventions in linguistics. There is no other H sign in Hittite other than this one with the semicircle under it and there is no other S in Hittite other than this one with the um, downwards facing arrow above it. The reason that these are, uh, well, also interestingly, we're not entirely sure how you pronounce that, whether it's a s or a sh. And again, we don't entirely know how you pronounce um, uh, this sign either. But it's just convention that we use these, uh, this extended Latin alphabet to represent the Hittite. It's actually the same word here in the Luvian, which is quite useful. Let's go and try and find this Luvian form for grandfather in a real um, Luvian hieroglyph example. And that's what I have for you here. 
doesn't this look very aesthetic? I love Luvian hieroglyphs. I want to work more with them in the future. I took this from a book by Annick Payne uh, called Hieroglyphic Luvian, published in 2014. However, in the book themselves, they took this um, uh, picture of the hieroglyphics from an earlier book, Hawkins 2000. Uh, so check either one of those out if you want to see what this looked like in reality. So uh, it's, it's from a text about a king and the king was praising himself and basically saying how the gods uh, were favouring him more than his predecessors, than his fathers and his uh, grandfathers. And we have a short part of this um, text represented here. And the English translation is, and my fathers and grandfathers. So how do we read Hieroglyphic Luvian? Well, we read from top to bottom. Um, it's bi-directional, as in the sense that you read one line either from left to right and the following line from right to left, usually, but not always. And it kind of like on each line, it starts from the top. And I always feel that in Hieroglyphic Luvian that the choice of what symbol comes next is usually due to aesthetics and simply fitting things in. Uh, so you kind of sometimes have to uh, pay a little bit of attention to which sign is in which order. Let me explain the signs for you. This one is R, this one is me, this one is Z, and this one is HA. This is our uh, laryngeal that we're looking for, but this HA didn't evolve from Proto-Indo-European, so we're not actually interested in that one. This awesome glyph here, uh, which looks like some dude stabbing somebody, is TA. This sign here, which looks like a foot, is T, and this sign here again is Z. Here in the following line, we have the ideogram Avus, which in itself means grandfather. It's an ideogram, so it represents an idea and not necessarily um, a syllable value. But we also have Ha, Z, Ha. This Ha here is actually the second ha from our word, our root, hoo-ha for grandfather. So when we talk about looking for examples of uh, laryngeal theory in action, it's exactly here in the presence of this sign that we have here. These other signs, ha, even though they have the same you know, sonic value, they're not actually derived from Proto-Indo-European, particularly, although we could argue that the grammar is, because this is uh, simply the word for and. Uh, if you watch my previous video on Hittite and, we know that in Hittite and is a and ya, depending on what comes previously. Um, but it's not necessarily derived from Proto-Indo-European. This sonic value here is it's directly descendant from the values uh, that we um, predicted in the proto in the European reconstructed form for grandfather that we saw on the previous page so when we talk about seeing laryngeal theory in action it is right here now let's return to this slide where we've got our proto in the European forms this one here evolved into the Hittite word Harkis, Harkis, again in the nominative singular, which means white. Uh, this represents this sign, this is represented by this sign, and this one here. So here we have an example of our um, laryngeal in action. In fact, this sign represents a number of um, uh, combinations of this laryngeal with a vowel in Hittite. I've put up here the um, H2 and the H3 forms. That's because there's predicted that there's likely to be three, possibly four different laryngeals in Proto-Indo-European. Um, Hittite, or the Anatolian languages in general, only preserve two of them, uh, the second and the third. The f and people disagree about how these are, are, are pronounced, but I'll give you what I believe is the consensus uh, version and actually my uh, opinion as well, what I, what I think these... Uh, sounded like that this um, first laryngeal is probably like the breathy huh, huh, uh, that we have in English. Uh, the second laryngeal is probably like how we, we say this, 
the, the CH in loch, loch. And the third one is how we say the CH in the Polish word. Niechże. Niechże. More or less. Again, I, I, if I think there's a part in this video where people will, will disagree and argue, it's, it's about the, how we uh, pronounce these three values exactly. It is believed, as I said, that in um, the Anatolian languages that two were inherited, although it's not entirely sure because we have we don't have much evidence for being able to differentiate between these two laryngeals in action because we use the same sign to represent both. And it's unsure whether the whether possibly the, the second laryngeal in Hittite, in fact, was inherited from somewhere else and not in the European languages we spoke about before. So Harkis, Harkis we have the um, Hittite form of the Proto-Indo-European and in the first position we can see our laryngeal in action. But let's not just stop there, let's look at an actual Hittite text, right? So I've taken this directly from the, from, from the source material, so it's like somebody has um, taken a look at the Kanaya form in the uh, clay tablet and has um, Obviously, Kanaya form is, is three dimensional, but in a two dimensional format, you know, represented the Kanaya form here for us. I've presented five lines. The line counter is here, so this would be line 30 in a longer text. It's from the 10 year annals of the Hittite king Mershali II. Very interesting. It's worth going to read a translation, uh, even if you don't want to work with the Hittite transliteration or the Kanaya form. Um, interestingly, these, uh, you know, they also indicate where there's breaks in, tab in the tablet, but where possible they, they, they put what, it, you know, what, what they can see what is visible. Well, let me just read the, um, uh, the line for you. Um, we've got some Samarograms here, Kur, Kur, Mesh, Lukor. Then we have an Akkadiagram, Inna, Mu, Ten, Kam, Taruhun Natkan Kuenun. The translation in English would be I defeated these enemy countries in 10 years and I destroyed them. Uh, this here is the 10 years. Um, we don't know the um, sound value for 10, but we know how to represent it uh, in Kanaya form. It is here where my cursor is indicating. Kuenun is the verb I destroyed and what we're interested in is this verb here, I defeated, because we have inside it the laryngeal that we're looking for and we can see its value represented twice in this syllable, uh, and in this syllable, hu. Huh. So in Hittite Kanaya form, we can only represent vowels with individual signs. Uh, with the consonants, they're always represented in combination with another vowel and even sometimes with another consonant like we have here. Uh, and so we can see our laryngeals in action in this Hittite verb, I defeated, I defeated. What is the Proto-Indo-European root of this verb? And it actually means in Proto-European something like to cross, to cross over. And I guess in, in Hittite, it took on the meaning to conquer in the, in the sense of like you crossed over um, another uh, city, state's land or territory in order to conquer them uh, or that you were able to cross over uh, uh, to, uh, to conquer them, to take control of them, to, to, to beat them in battle. Interestingly, uh, this root form in Proto-Indo-European is where we get the Latin trans. And I believe there is a derived form in Sanskrit as well, which means something like to overcome um, or to succeed in, which is why we believe that um, Taruhun, taruhun uh, has the translation that it has. But most importantly, it gives us an example of the laryngeals that we've been looking for. So, I hope this was useful for you today um, and I hope that there was something that you could take out from it. It was a pleasure uh, on my behalf to be able to spend these moments talking to you about Hittite and Proto-Indo-European. I look forward to speaking to everybody again really soon. Have a great day and goodbye for now.